Hey guys. So nice to see you guys. Happy Saturday. I hope that you all had a wonderful 4th of July. And I believe Independence Day, if you guys are from the United States or from any other country that has its own Independence Day, um, I think it speaks pretty loudly towards what we SLDs who are in recovery, people who are self-love deficient, who are fighting so hard tooth and nail to become self-love abundant, which is a cure, what I call the codependency cure. So happy Independence Day to all of you, whether or not your, your country um, celebrated it on July 4th, because this is the year 2019 that all of you will become independent emotionally, relationally from pathological narcissists. Speaking of that, I am giving a two-day live seminar in the Chicago area. Actually, it's um, closer to O'Hare Airport than Chicago, um, maybe about a 10-minute um, drive. And um, I don't usually do trainings anymore. As I've said in my last couple um, um, live events, I just, I'm just just tired of them. There was a point in time where I was traveling all the time. I think in two years, I, I, I went to like 65, 70 cities. Um, um, it was just, I just needed to take better care of myself. So now I do what I do now. And once a year, sometimes, you know, sometimes if someone hires me, I do it more. I give these live events. But this live event is unlike any other live event I've done, except, <laughs> except the very first human magnet syndrome event I did. And let me take a guess here, 2012. That was actually before the book, The Human Magnet Syndrome was written and I even had the title. The reason it's similar in, in scope and gravity is it's all new stuff. Um, I have been talking a lot about, of course, the human magnet syndrome material and what I call my codependency cure material. And that is, the codependency cure material is everything that answers the human magnet syndrome. People have been always asking me, okay, this book is great. Thank you. It's changed my life. But what do I do? Over the last six, seven years, I've been trying to put together um, an explanation and how I lead my clients who formerly were called codependents, but SLDs or self-love deficient, deficient people. Uh, I lead them through my program, which I call my self-love recovery treatment program, um, to finally the, the transitional self that they always deserved, and that is the, being self-love abundant. Because we were, we were always born perfect. We didn't have a choice um, in parents. Um, and that's why I love the saying by George Eliot, it's never too late to be the person you should have been. I love that saying because you know, we come into this world and, and we expect our parents to, to love, respect, and care for us and nurture us, to, to give us a, um, a healthy, loving attachment experience. And if one of our parents is a narcissist, you know, if, that, if that's the case, the probability is high that the other is a SLD or codependent. Our childhood was pretty traumatic. And, um, and that trauma, that horrible trauma, which um, um, most of us call attachment trauma, is almost impossible to treat using standard psychotherapy. That is why on Saturday, July 13th, I am rolling out my training, which I've already spoke, spoken about, I did a YouTube video on, but it's called Healing the Inner Trauma Child or the Hitch um, Psychotherapy Method that talks about trauma and the healing and the integration of it. And that is a part of my self-love recovery program. So this training, in the Chicago area um, is on uh, Saturday. It's the hitch or the healing, the inner trauma child is, um, is on Saturday. And then the next day, I, instead of giving my typical training or seminar, which I, I call the codependency cure, I decided to just focus on two of the stages, the stages that are most about how to escape, survive the escape, of narcissistic abuse 
with limited harm to yourself and your loved ones, like your children. I have a lot of information I want to teach you what is currently stage four, which is preparing for the narcissistic storm. Um, and what I learned is that taking on the narcissist adversary, the gaslighter, the bully, the manipulator, the triangulator, the person who poises everyone's minds, the one who is so skilled and adept at avoiding responsibility and blaming others, um, there's just no way that you could win. When I say win, it's it's winning is getting out without fighting. There's no way that you can win if you're not prepared. And I found that most of my work in psychotherapy was not only preparing the SLDs. So what is a narcissist? What type of narcissist is that person? Um, because um, narcissists, pathological narcissists, as I write in my Human Magnet Syndrome book, not all narcissists are the same. That's why I call them pathological narcissists. And I'm very, very clear. I'm um, in stages four, um, um, preparing for the narcissistic storm. Is its importance is directly related to how difficult stage five is, which I will be talking to you a little bit about today. Stage five is setting boundaries in a hostile environment. I always start out my stage four and stage five discussions with what I call is my uh, my Surgeon General warning. You know, just like in a pack of cigarettes, there's a warning that says, if you do something that's poisonous or bad for you, you know, something, please be warned, something's going to be bad. bad. Something badly is going to happen. So here's my Surgeon General warning. Codependency or self-love deficit disorder causes severe psychological birth defects. The abrupt cessation will result in severe episodes of self-doubt, self-lying, and prolonged bouts of painful pathological loneliness. Expect at least six months of ridicule, condemnation, rejection from loved ones, as well as a rapid loss of friends, family members, and others who were formerly known as loved ones. Well, that is my surgeon general warning. I'm neither a surgeon nor general. And so stage four and stage five emphasize um, this warning because, you know, you've heard the saying when the, the, the stuff hits the fan, um, Stage five is 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 when the stuff hits the fan phase. That is when, because of stage four, and you've been prepared and taught, and you've um, you've mastered or if, or have are learned very well the observe don't absorb technique, the um, how to avoid a induced conversation, the three strike boundary rule, and all of the information that I'm going to teach you in the first half of um, July 14th, once you are prepared, you have become what I call the, um, the SLD or future SLA, self of abundant master chess player. Because if you're going to pre prevail, if you're going to tr uh, be triumphant in stage five and set boundaries and actually get out of these relationships that are so harmful, you have to predict everything before you do it because that way you will outsmart the narcissist. Believe it or not, the narcissists are not very smart. The only reason they seem smart is they can control only one type of person and that is the SLD or codependent. And there's something about self-love deficit disorder. When you are an SLD, you just don't think logically and rationally. Stage four prepares you so in this chess game so that when you get to stage five and you set the boundaries, you are not only aware of what you're going to do, the reactions of what the other person's going to do and your reactions, and you can play it out just like a good chess player. Uh, I'm not good at chess, but I do know that people that are really good, um, they study their adversaries or their opponents, and they know exactly um, how they play, and their style, and their tenet, and, and their and their, the way that they move their pieces. So in stage five, um, you start to set the boundaries, and it's a 
it's not nearly as frightening as you would imagine because you have spent so much time preparing yourself in the previous stage. But it's scary because you know my Surgeon General warning is going gonna, is gonna to come to fruition. You're going to lose about 75% of all the people that you thought loved you or all the people that you loved. And you won't, it will be difficult, but you will have so well uh, mastered, observe, don't absorb, which is a technique that I will be expanding on in great detail and adding more information. That the, on a, I will be rolling out the new version of the observe, don't absorb technique, the updated version. But you will have um, mastered this form of what I call purposeful and healthy disassociation. Observe, don't absorb, so that you will not be tense and anxious and scared. So at stage five, you set boundaries and the stuff hits the fan and you know it and you're not surprised. And of course, your neck, all your 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 chest moves are very well coordinated. So you know that this is gonna happen. So either you have already prepared for that, and, and that that's why stage four is is um, as if not more important than the stage five information. And you will execute everything and it will be difficult, but you won't be surprised. In my last uh, YouTube video, I talked about how people joke with me and they call me a psychic or uh, a narcissist whisperer. And of course, I think it's funny, but I bring it up again because um, um, it's really easy for me to um, predict what my client's narcissist will do because they're so unpredictable. Um, so I wanna give you um, a sneak preview of some, um, something that's new that's not anywhere else that um, I just wrote. Um, actually, I just wrote today. Now, of course, when I say I just wrote that, that means I've had this in my head. I've been working on this with my clients. I just don't make this stuff up. In this slide, um, I say, um, uh, the slide is pathological narcissist reactions to stage five. They are predictable. And then uh, the slide starts off with someone who's like really angry. And then that then the picture dissolves into a person who's grabbing someone's leg and it, and it looks like, please don't leave me. So um, let me uh, share with you what will be part of training uh, on the stage five setting boundaries in a hostile environment. So um, there are nine phases that are fairly common and predictable that pathological narcissists go through when they are met with a person who has effectively um, completed and finished stage four and has and with all the tools and the emotional health and uh, and um, burgeoning self-love abundance come to stage five. Number one is, and by the way, I should say, um, and it's actually in a previous slide. So there's so much information, but I just want to give you a bit here. But in a previous slide, I say, you must know your pathological narcissist. You must know them. Because how we do stage four, preparing for the storm, and how we do stage five, which is executing the plans, discussed in, in stage four or setting boundaries in a hostile environment is dependent on your pathological narcissist diagnosis. So in my book, I talk about um, there's three forms of pathological narcissist, someone who is has a narcissistic personality disorder, someone who has a borderline personality disorder, or someone who has an antisocial personality disorder or sociopath, or some people say psychopath. Um, I further explain that narcissistic personality disorder is subdivided into four categories. Your overt, or what I call garden variety narcissist, um, your covert narcissist, your malignant narcissist, and your productive narcissist. Um, narcissists respond, depending on if they're NPD, BPD, or ASPD, they respond much, much differently to um, um, the, the boundaries in stage five. And of course, because of all the work we've done in stages one, two, three, and four, um, 
the SLD, soon to be a SLA, self-love abundant, knows exactly how their narcissist is going to respond to um, stage five and setting the boundaries. So when I read the next, when I read the, the, the predictable reactions, please know that there's a, some variability based upon um, many factors. And uh, so this is a generalization. So the first reaction they have is man, they become even more manipulative and they turn up the gas and the gaslighting. I've come to understand that all pathological narcissists in different ways um, use some form of gaslighting. Um, the most severe form of gaslighting is, is perpetrated against SLDs by covert narcissists and ASPDs, by the way. So um, number one is they, they become even more manipulative. Um, they try to get more into the head of um, their partner. They try to undermine their confidence. They try to twist their reality, and they try to make them believe that they can or cannot do what they say they what they say they're and warn about. And if that doesn't work, the second phase is ag aggression and threats. That's where the uh, pathological narcissist, or I will shorten the PNARC, that's what I use in my trainings. I always, uh, the PNARC, pathological narcissist, becomes a bully, aggressive, and threatening. And there's different forms of, of that. And, um, and I'll talk more about that in the training. This is only a preview. Um, and, you know, but, you know, some of it is, you know, physical violence, which is very, very dangerous. And, and please, 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 please be careful. And then there's other types of um, aggression and threats. If that doesn't work, and none of it works because you've done really well in stage four, you're going to see that them cycle right through all nine of these. Then they become passive or covertly aggressive. So now that they realize the bullying and the, and the overt aggression doesn't work, so now they start to go into sabotage mode, triangulation mode. And triangulation basically means you um, get another person, you feed another person information that's not necessarily true to, um, um, to team up against the person you want to hurt. Um, so sabotage, triangulation, poisoning the minds of people. Um, um, and many, many, many other forms of passive and covertly aggressive uh, forms of retaliation. When that doesn't work, and you are this perfect, stoic, what I call ODA ninja, observe, don't absorb, or ODA warrior, we have a couple nicknames, from, and, and you've predicted all this, and you've not only predicted it, but you've ensured that you are safe and and you actually are several always several steps ahead of the, the peanut then all of a sudden we've got us four they're willing to negotiate negotiate now um it's funny because i often warn my clients that this will happen it's oh no 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 and i say well they're gonna negotiate they're gonna go to therapy they're gonna do this and they say, oh they'll never do that i go just trust me but when, when the, the manipulation, one, the aggression, two, the passive and covert aggression, three, doesn't work, then we find out, and I have a whole slide on this, but I'll just say very, very quickly, we find out how afraid the narcissist is of being alone, lonely. Now, everyone knows that SLDs or codependents um, suffer from pathological loneliness. It is the withdrawal symptom of SLDD addiction. It is incredibly painful and seemingly impossible to get past, seemingly. Um, but I've never talked about that narcissists, they actually have much worse pathological uh, loneliness and much worse core shame. They just, because of their personality disorder, they're able to compartmentalize that away and not feel it and think it. So, and when they are willing to negotiate, they're starting to get scared um, because, you know, we know about bullies. Bullies are bullies because they're cowards themselves. And when the negotiation doesn't work, then we go to five. Um, then they just say flat out, okay, I'm going to stop. I'll stop having sex with your sister. I will stop um, 
um, uh, drink, I'll stop um, yelling at you or the children. I'll, I'll come home after work. I will um, help you uh, watch the children. I will, they just start, they start to um, promise you what you've always wanted them to do. Now, because you've been a great student in stage four, and you know that it's not going to happen, and and um, and sometimes my clients will come back to me and go, Russ, he's going to stop or she's going to stop, and I, I calm I calm them down and I remind them of the discussions we had in stage four. But when, but most SLDs say, okay, fine, <laughs> please do stop. But, um, and what happens is their motivation to stop is not is not genuine and they can't stop you know sometimes they have an addiction sometimes their narcissistic hunger hunger is so deep sometimes it's in a sometimes it's an affair but when they when you find out they can't stop and you just keep saying i'm done the next one is agreeing to go to therapy or treatment i can't tell you how many of my clients i've had to calm down and say this is not as good as you think it is, and and I start I start to warn them that the most dangerous thing that you can do um, in this stage is to go to marriage therapy. It is completely dangerous uh, because someone with a personality disorder is unable to take responsibility for their problems and um, have empathy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if my client listens to me, they will either not go to uh, marriage therapy or they will go to marriage therapy and they will use observe, don't absorb, and they will let it fall apart. Because once the marriage therapy does not work for the narcissist, the narcissist will quit. Um, um, a narcissist will go to psychotherapy and, and they will find someone, and there's a lot of therapists that don't know anything about um, Narciss uh, narcissism, and they'll find someone where they can just vent, and they'll say, look, I'm going to therapy. But if the SLD should, like if she was a, she or he was a fly in the wall, um, they would know that in the therapy, they're not talking about what's wrong with them. They're talking about what's happening to them and how badly they feel, and they're incapable in their therapy to actually get to the fundamental problems that are responsible for their narcissism. So if they go to therapy, they inevitably stop because uh, the therapist usually pisses them off when the therapist sets a boundary or disagrees with them. Or they'll stay if the therapist just kind of doesn't know what they're doing and just kind of nods their head and listens and, and gives a lot of empathy. Um, and that doesn't work. They drop out of therapy. The next one is they start to humanize themselves by talking about their abuse history. That is when they... Um, that is when they start talking about, please don't leave me, please, I was abused as a child, and they start to become emotional, and they actually start to remember um, what they usually don't remember about their their attachment trauma. See, a, a narcissist have attachment trauma also. It's just exponentially more severe, and as it, as it, um, and because of that, it's not amenable um, it, um, to... Um, psychotherapy but when they're about to lose um, their their object that is um, their SLD object that has kept them feeling good about themselves and everything is not work um, they portray themselves as broken and sympathetic people now this is actually um, if you think about it it's probably a really smart move for the narcissist to do that because he knows the SLD the partner who's getting ready to leave him is empathetic. And by the way, empathy is nice. Empathy is good. Compassion is good. But because you've done so well on stage four and stage five, you kind of watch that in your observe and absorb mode, and you realize this is nothing more um, than um, um, a guise. It's a it's a tactic, and it's just really too late because, as I've often explained to my clients, it doesn't really matter if they start talking about what happened to them. It does not, what happened to us does not excuse how we treat another person. And I explain that to all of my SLDs. You can't blame someone else for your problem. You have to take responsibility for it. And SLDs can, and if they're in treatment, they do, 
and they and they get better. So when number seven, humanizing oneself by talking about the abuse history doesn't work, then we go to eight, and that is the all-out attack or destruction, or in the case of people with borderline personality disorder, self-destruction or threats of suicide. And that is when um, it's the last gasp. It's almost like you have your um, your hands around the throat of a pathological narcissist, and you're trying to um, um, and you're trying, and they're experiencing that as you're trying to choke them and kill them. Now, of course, I'm not talking about murder. <laughs> I'm just talking about observe, don't absorb. Watch all of these nine phases play out, but the subjective experience from the narcissist is like you're choking him out. You're trying to kill him, and they will and and they will fight with everything they have, which explains everything up to this phase, which is eight, which is all-out attack or destruction or self-destruction. It's all out. And when that doesn't work, because the SLD has prepared for both um, the, the danger of the attack and the destruction, and it's done great um, predictive awareness work, the um, observe, don't absorb work um, is, is solid, and everything else that they've learned in stage four keeps that that strength, that, that, that new base of self-love abundance solid, um, then um, it's over. Um, say, um, Someone does attempt suicide, and they and they they do have borderline personality disorder, and they realize that their uh, suicide attempt, if they should survive, does not bring the SLD back, but actually makes things worse for them. Or if the all-out attack or destruction ends up in a um, an arrest, a restraining order, or um, massive uh, protective initiative, which was well planned. Then we're, we come to the last phase, and that's replacement. That's when the pathological narcissist needs to, to find the new victim. Now, that might take a little while, or that might happen right away. So what I wanted to do in talking about the pathological narcissist reactions to the SLD's um, boundaries that are set in the stage five, which is setting boundaries in a hostile environment, I wanted to help you see that this is going to be an incredible training because that was just one slide. Um, I got um, I got like 100 of them, actually 125 for, for the whole day. And it's going to be filled with information that's going to be helpful, informative, uplifting, and for some, life-changing. And to know ahead of time, for example, these nine reactions, manipulation, aggression, passive or covert aggression, willingness to negotiate, agreeing to stop problems, agreeing to go to therapy, humanizing themselves by talking about their abuse, all out self or others destruction and replacement. And if you like know all this ahead of time, you're cool as a cucumber. And that's what I want this weekend to be is I want you guys by coming to Chicago um, is to get this life-saving information which is specifically created for the general audience and therapist all of my work all of my work including my, my books and my trainings um, are written right down the middle and I've never had a complaint well that's not true ever so often I, um, I'll get a <laughs> They're usually narcissists. They'll come to my trainings and, and they'll pick something out and, and, and they'll have a big issue with it. Uh, of course, I use my observe, not absorb, and just let them do their thing. So I hope that you guys will consider the value of this training, which, by the way, is already discounted. Um, I discounted it 15%. It's actually priced really well considering that it's a really nice hotel and there's going to be food and coffee. Um, it's not a bare bones thing. Um, and if you go to both days, I believe it's a 15% discount. And if you're a student um, or have a disability um, or something uh, similar, um, 
we'll give you a discount, but you'll have to write at help at selfloverecovery.com. Um, the sessions um, will be recorded. Um, the, the weekend, the, the two days of, uh, will be recorded on selfloverecovery.com, my company, Self Love Recovery Institute. I sell all of my educational seminars um, and, um, and they're available. The difference between the recording and the live event is the recording will be edited. Um, the live events, um, other than not being edited, um, um, they, um, there's a synergy and a connection. Um, there's a sy synergy and a connection when people are together in a live event that um, not only do you learn, but there's, um, and so most people prefer the live event because they're around other people, they're, they get to talk and connect. And plus, you know what? Um, Chicago is a really great city to visit in the summer. And if you're going to come to see me and you're not from Chicago, stay a couple extra days. There's so much to do, and um, and the, and the public transportation is great. Anyone who wants the video, um, will, um, once the video is available, um, there will be a 50% discount, um, and we will provide that information later. Um, but um, once the video, um, and if, if you are if you are on our mailing list, you'll get an email. If you are not, and everyone listen, if you want to be on my mailing list, mail us your email address at help at selfloverecovery.com, and you will get an email saying when the vi when it is available on video. And if you if you had attended the live event, um, um, we will provide you with. Um, a discount code, but you'll have to write us and um, and to get that. You guys are great, um, and it looks like you're having really great conversation. And that's one of the great things I like about my YouTube lives. It's like you guys are really connecting, which is exactly why I suggest my live events versus buying the videos because you connect with other people and you make connections and sometimes lifelong friends. Okay, guys, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, Please consider coming to the live seminars on Saturday and Sunday, July 13th and 14th. July 13th will be on the Healing the Inner Trauma Child or Hitch Psychotherapy Method, where I roll out for the first time how to actually heal and integrate attachment trauma, which is responsible for SLDD or codependency. And I talk in great length and detail about trauma and and how to understand it. The second day um, is um, the first three hours is on my stage four, which is uh, the storm, <laughs> surviving the narcissistic storm. In other words, it's it's a preparatory work that enables someone to be successful at finally standing up and setting boundaries with the narcissist. The second part of the day, three hours, is on my stage five, which is actually setting boundaries in a hostile environment. I hope to see you guys there. And if you can't make it, send us your email address at help at selfloverecovery.com, and we'll put you on our email list. And when, um, if, uh, when, the, when the videos for these trainings are available, we'll send you an email. Okay? You guys, as always, um, are tremendously important to me. And I hope that this information that I talk about today, independent of the trainings, because I always try to give you guys information. I'm always trying to teach you guys stuff. Um, and it's my job. I'm also trying to um, just do my job. Um, but I just I hope that you continue to build your self-love abundance. And if you are self-love deficient, is don't give up on it, because once you become self love abundant, the world changes. All right, guys, you're great. And I hope to see some of you um, in Chicago soon. And I'm sure I'll be seeing a lot of you um, on the internet somewhere.